What if you could invest in a hard asset like silver and then earn a return in that same asset by passing the fiat dollar system entirely? Now you can. Monetary Metals has made a name for itself by generating a yield on gold and silver for their clients over the past eight years and counting. Now they're offering the first silver bond in almost 200 years with a 12% annual interest rate paid in physical ounces of silver. Available to accredited investors only, investors in the bond receive a fixed 12% coupon on silver paid in physical ounces of silver, plus any silver price appreciation. Over half the bond has already been sold and the remaining allocations are going fast. Do not miss being a part of this historic offering. Protect and grow your wealth in an asset that has stood the test of time. Secure your spot at realvision.com slash metals. Hi, it's Raoul. Guess what? I can't believe, but we're turning 10 at Real Vision this September. I can't believe it's a whole decade of democratizing the very best financial intelligence and building this kind of super community of finance, including the super platform of finance. And to celebrate, we're throwing a virtual party on September 27th at 12 p.m. And you are on the guest list. It's free to join, so don't miss out. If you're not a member, you can sign up at realvision.com forward slash free. We've also got a trade ideas competition where you can flex your market smarts plus some exclusive limited birthday merch and much more planned for September. It's going to be a lot of fun. So sign up realvision.com forward slash free and we'll see you at the party September 27th at 12 p.m. That's realvision.com forward slash free. Welcome to Real Vision. I'm Ash Bennington. Today, I'm joined by Jem Carson. Jem, welcome back to the show. Great to be back. Good to see you, Ash. Jem, it's perfect timing. It's so great to have you back. Obviously, yesterday was Fed Day, a more aggressive rate cut than expected, 50 basis points. Today, markets rallying after the cut. Uh, here's the Bloomberg headline right now. S&P 500 hits all-time high on soft landing hopes. Uh, Jem, I've been thinking about this show here for a couple of days, all the things that I want to cover. First, obviously, I want to get your take on the 50 basis point cut yesterday from the Fed. Second, I want to frame out the basic explanation for all the things that we talked about last time that you were on the show, uh, short volatility, what it means for markets, indexation, structured products, market breadth, all of that stuff. And then third, finally, I want to tie it all back together, meaning I want to see how what you see, what you think about the broad themes that you bring to markets are shaped by your view of what happened yesterday. I know that's a mouthful. Jem, big picture, 50,000 foot overview. Where are we right now in the wake of the cut? So uh, the cut is something, by the way, we, we've been calling for a 50 basis point since uh, July. Um, uh, the economy has clearly uh, been uh, been showing signs that, uh, that the Fed can do this. And that didn't mean they had to do this, by the way. Um, but it's showing signs they could. Um, uh, the way I see it, uh, you know, the Fed has realized that they're better off uh, being aggressive early uh, um, than than kind of doing, let's say, twenty five basis points and twenty five basis points. Uh, and and they've shown that again and again uh, through the last ten years, but particularly in more recent history. So this is a a process that they have adopted. And the reason they do that, is because the power of a cut is not the actual cut itself. The power of a cut is actually what it does to the psychology and, and how what it does to controlling five-year yields, 10-year yields, things that actually matter for the economy. The truth is much of these cuts was already priced uh, into the market in, in the five-year and the 10-year um, uh, prior. This is a We'll do whatever it takes, right? If you say the right things at the right time, it doesn't really matter what you actually do. It matters what the uh, the, the confidence uh, that it gives uh, to the market. So this 50 basis point uh, is completely in line with what we would expect given what we're doing, uh, what we're seeing in the, in the, um, uh, in the economy. Uh, and again, not because the economy needs it, but the Fed is really trying to make sure we they avoid uh, the recession. Um, and and uh, this is in particular, the other timing part is important. This is particularly at a moment 
Uh, and the, the Fed understands these things where, where the market is at a, a bit of a crossroads and uh, they want to avoid any uh, significant volatility um, if they can uh, into uh, an, the election with a lot of stress that's happening both overseas in Japan, um, as well as importantly in the vol markets uh, around the election and, and stress around that. So this 50 base point cut makes complete sense uh, for what they're, the Fed is trying to do and what they've communicated uh, is how they is the, how they operate with policy. Now, to be clear, you asked me a second question, where are we? What does that mean? Um, I think people would be making a great mistake and are in the market and assuming that this means we're going to get uh, you know, uh, another uh, 200 basis points of cuts or 150 basis points of cuts. Uh, uh, the reality is uh, much like in December last year, the rhetoric alone, and this is a kind of bold move uh, early, will do the work for the Fed. And ultimately, people will be surprised at the resilience of the, uh, the economy coming out of it. There is an asymmetric uh, inelasticity, uh, you, can, you can say in economic terms, of these cuts in this environment. There is a ton of sequestered demand in real estate, among other, other places, that uh, is sitting wait, has been sitting waiting for lower interest rates. And so the amount of support that comes that's tied to these interest rates is not linear. So if you raise interest rates, it does, in other words, there's a massive lag and it does not slow the economy nearly as much as a reduction helps the economy. And I think that's an important thing to understand. Um, and so we, much like we saw when the when the, the, the Fed last December was, was very aggressive up front, they did that on purpose for a reason. Um, we're likely to not see a meaningful recession, if a recession at all. I, I would say we're likely to skate by it. Um, but uh, that's because of this action from the Fed. Okay, Jim, let me ask you this. Uh, let's talk about this nexus of broader economy right now to financial markets, the role of liquidity. Uh, we had this conversation last time. You talked about the different frameworks, different time horizons uh, between uh, between the short term and the longer term, the market, uh, quoting Benjamin Graham, as a voting machine versus the market as a weighing machine in the longer term. Talk a little bit about uh, where you see that continuum right now based on what we saw yesterday, the market reaction this morning to what we've seen yesterday, and what your expectation is for the shorter and intermediate term re relative to asset prices. I'm going to zoom way out. I'm going to start at 30,000 feet. Um, uh, during an election year, during a, during a populist cycle, right? We are at a populist period. Uh, it has been building for uh, over a decade. Um, actually, I would date it back to uh, 2010 is when it really um, kind of started going. We saw uh, Occupy Wall Street and uh, you know the Tea Party. But the, the, the generation that was really pushing these populist ideals were the ones who had lived through it and, and grown up through it, which were millennials. And, and they really needed to grow to political dominance. And baby boomers had to start moving on, passing away. And the, the baton had to be tossed politically, uh, passed. So that's what happened. And, and uh, more, you know, if, you, if you look at uh, you know, politics, Trump is a response to that populism. He was able to bring the right uh, kicking and screaming left. And the left, by the way, has gone left too with Bernie Sanders, AOC, all of the um, realities. These, these are a, a, a result, not that people think uh, Trump is a cause. He's less of a cause and he's more of a response. He's a marketer. He gives people what they want. Uh, the people want populism. He is giving them populism. This is not a, a, a political uh, argument. I just want to be clear, um, uh, as are the people on the left. And, uh, but, but importantly, the right has come left, and that has driven populist policy responses. We saw massive fiscal policy during COVID. We continue to see that. We've, we're seeing massive uh, uh, protectionism um, and, and deglobalization as a, as a function of populism. Uh, that's driving global conflict. That's driving um, the labor shortages, commodity um, strength um, across the board issues we've seen before. You just gotta, gotta go look back at the 60s and 70s. So given that, I think we have to start there at 30,000 feet to say, where are we? What are we doing? What, what's going on with the weighing machine to answer your question? And Jim, the Jim, let, me, machine, let me jump in there and, and ask you a question here because I want you to define this, explain it, and give a little bit of the broader context here because I'm sure that people on the right and on the left are both uh, perhaps a little bit jarred, a little bit shocked by this idea of Donald Trump representing the right coming to the left. I expect that what the uh, broader thrust of that is, is that you're seeing uh, this move uh, toward 
uh, debt monetization toward greater spending. Uh, you're seeing, in essence, uh, the the death of the deficit hawks in the Republican Party. Talk a little bit about what you mean by the right is coming to the left. Yeah, to be clear, we're not talking social issues. We're not talking uh, conservatism. This is not a political thing. We're talking economics and capital markets. That's what we're here to talk about, right? And in terms of economics and capital markets, it's pretty obvious. If you, uh, the right, uh, you traditionally, the way it's classically understood and, and, and as, as it should be, the right is, is free markets, small government, uh, and, and uh, open borders. Uh, it, it's globalization. Uh, we have seen that on the Republican Party since, you know, the last hundred or so years. Um, what that is not what the Republican Party uh, or the, the left, which obviously has never really well, uh, traditionally has not represented that. Uh, the left, to be clear, is uh, is is larger government, uh, uh, you know, helping people that are on the margins who are um, uh, under, you know, who ha- who the system doesn't work for, and essentially. I would I'd characterize the difference. I think most people know this as uh, that you know, demo, the, the left, uh, whether you call them Democrats or any party globally, um, are there to uh, maximize median outcomes broadly, um, as opposed to the right is there to maximize uh, ma- uh, mean outcomes to, to maximize GDP. Um, it is it is more about supply side, uh, you know, the right is, and the left is more about demand side economics. You know, that's a broad generalization, but that's the broad economic, you know. If you're looking left to right, at some point they connect on the other side, but they are uh, those are the two sides of, of policy. Um, both sides at this point are left. Both sides are um, out looking out for the median out, uh, outcome, thinking about protectionism, uh, uh, looking looking out at at, at throwing up uh, tariffs and borders, and uh, talking about the rusted out cities in Middle America. I mean that is that is what uh, populism is, uh, and and populism is a left. Uh, on the political spectrum. So that's the only point I'm making. This is not a political point, is that policy ha- economically has gone left. We There's no other way to, to explain it. Uh, uh, just look at the reality. We, had, we have had the largest fiscal policy, not just in nominal terms, in real terms by far, 10 times in real terms, the size of the New Deal, uh, about the same size in terms of relative to GDP um, as the New Deal in the last um, uh, you know, four years. Um, uh, you know, and by the way, that didn't start with Biden. That started with Trump, and it's continued with Biden, right? So, right. it's important to understand this is not a political argument. It is just what's happening, and the reason it's happening is not because some president or some market is some some uh, policymaker is making some decision. It's happening because the people, whether you're poor white male in West Virginia or a poor black woman in uh, Chicago are both dissatisfied with their situation. Now, they point at each other and blame each other. Don't get me wrong. But the issue is not one another. The issue is Federal Reserve policy for 40 years driving inequality and frustrating uh, the middle class on down um, for the top 1% or higher. And that's that's the, the, the primary driver. It doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't take five years, 10 years. It takes a generation or two, 20 to 40 years, generally 30 to 40 years before that frustration uh, people start looking at their fathers and saying, well, my father's doing worse than his father, and now I'm doing worse. This is enough is enough. It's a loss of status. And 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 the youth are labor, by definition. As you get older, you have capital as a, as a, as a general society, and uh, you become generally more Republican or more, uh, I guess, more right uh, as a function, more uh, in, in favor of assets. And as a generation, people who grow up as labor, or the youth, are generally more left. That's just the way it goes because uh, they ha- they don't have assets and in the, the system is broken. They are the ones who have underperformed. They're the ones living at home, unable to buy a home, uh, living at home with mom and dad, uh, unable to, to buy a home. Uh, they're, the median uh, wealth creation um, uh, in, in the United States relative to baby boomers from millennials is now at 45%, up from 40% of where baby boomers were at this time of generation, not just household formation, wealth creation. Um, Sort of staggering numbers, um, and the frustration is real. So that's what I'm talking about. This is not a political argument, and and both sides, as a structure, thirty thousand feet have come, um, you know, uh, have gone left. Um, that is driving these trends. That the, the people and the frustration of the forty years uh, inequality is a we have a Gini coefficient of 0. 0.47 now, which is measures the actual um, what the width of the distribution of wealth. That was 0.32 in 1982. So it's a dramatic expansion of inequality. Uh, 1.75% uh, 
Uh, GDP growth for 40 years in real terms, adjusted for inflation in the United States, the median uh, uh, median salary has gone up 0.75% real terms. 1% of that 1.75% for 40 years compounded has gone to the very, very, very top 0.1. And uh, that is uh, what's driven that inequality. So those are, those are just some numbers to, to get your head around it. But that's, that's what we're seeing. And when you see populist cycles like this, they don't stop overnight because you have to readjust this inequality. We have borrowed, the Federal Reserve has borrowed from the future by, uh, you know, they have been able to, to maintain low inflation while maximizing growth, which is what government told them to do, right? But they never put them in charge of inequality. So there's a cheat code for the Fed. If we just do supply side economics, drive uh, money to the top 0.1% in capital, we will get more growth, but it'll all go to the 0.1%. And it won't cause inflation because the people on, on the bottom are getting it. Um, at the end of the day, that's great for businesses. That is uh, awful for the people and labor in in the uh, in the system. And uh, and after a while, uh, people uh, you know there's a let them eat cake moment, and and people uh, you know have had enough. Uh, particularly the young and millennials who are the primary growing uh, voting population. Um, so anyway, so that's 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 the thirty thousand. To get back to the original question, this is the weighing machine, right? This is where things are going. Uh, we've seen this movie before, but this movie doesn't operate over weeks and months and quarters. It operates over decades. Um, and we have a 15 to 20 year period, historically is what we're looking at, of, of populism. We're about three, four years, I'd say about four years into that cycle. Um, so 10 to 15 years left um, in a massive weighing machine cycle, which is incredibly poor for equities and bonds. Uh, the last time we saw that, 1968 to 1982, we had a 14-year period where equities in real terms lost 70% of their value. Digest that. In 14 years, if you invest in the equity market, not only did you put up with all the volatility, but in real terms, you lost 70% of your money. Nobody, you know, that's, nobody thinks past 40 years, but that's the last time. The reason we're looking at that period, we're not cherry picking, is that's the exact time that interest rates went from bottom left to top right, as opposed to top left, bottom right, which is what we've seen for the last 40 years. So people are, are, uh, are confusing correlation for causation. There is a, a, a reason that 60-40 has worked so well for 40 years, and that's just because interest rates went from 20 to zero. But people don't realize that when if interest rates go from zero to 20, that, that's incredibly, that the exact opposite happened. And 60, 40 blows up and there's all kinds of problems um, across the board. So the whole wealth advisory industry is built on this idea that there's a free lunch, that you can just close your eyes, buy stocks, buy bonds, and you will outperform the market. The reality is it's not that easy. And the reason that didn't exist before 1982 is because it didn't work. It didn't work. And, and passive investing didn't work either. And the reason passive investing is around is for that same reason. Uh, I will argue vehemently that that indexing has been around for 150 years. You know, the indexes are there. Like passive investing is just index investing. Why the heck didn't it exist as a as a major business until then? People are like this is a new technology. Passive investing is all the rage. Passive investing is is just momentum investing and in something that's worked for 40 years and it's at the end of that that cycle. So um, I think passive investing is. Uh, is it, it, a problem and will be, and it'll be too late when people realize it and people move away. Um, but active investing, it, it, it represents a real opportunity, particularly relative value investing, non-correlated investments. Um, so that's the weighing machine. And uh, to give some other numbers to these, this fact, if you look at the last time uh, we were in that 68 to 82 period and equities lost 70% of their value, by the way, bonds also, any duration got killed because interest went from zero to 20. Um, but if you, uh, you know, if you look at that period, now we go look at the elections during that period, whether you look at the four for, uh, from 68 to 82, or you look at, you add the other one before, uh, which I would also call was part of that populist, the beginning of that populist period. Um, and we can go through them, 64, 68, 72, you know, the, all, of, all the elections. Um, all of them were up double digits. And the average performance of the, uh, during those election years was 21%. Now, again, to put that in context, in the context of a 14-year period, that was uh, down 70% in real terms and flat nominally. Um, so you take out those four elections from those 14 years and you have 10 years left, the average nominal performance was negative eight and the average real performance was down 17%. Um, uh, so this, 
This rhymes. Guess what? We're going to be at 21% this year. Guess what? The last popular, uh, po- populist election, 2020, we were also up 21%. I'm not saying that it's going to be that exact number and there's a range, but they're consistently very good years. Why? That's not a coincidence. That's because during populist years, there is a bunch of fiscal and monetary stimulus to support the economy because it's an election year. <laughs> By the way, if you take those elections out of the election year data from 1928 to now 100 years of election data, The average election year is only up 5%. So it actually underperforms in every other year but a populist cycle. So it's not only consistent, reliable, double-digit, huge differences in outcomes. All the other years are dramatically negative. And in terms of why, we can explain why it's pretty easy. A a contested uh, uh, election where people are are driving populist policy and, uh, and policymakers are willing to give that fiscal and monetary policy to voters to cyclically stimulate in the short term is going to drive a bullish cycle within what's a rising interest rate environment and a really poor environment for stocks and equities. So now we can get to the voting machine a bit, right? Here we are at a really bad uh, uh, 10, 15 year uh, uh, weighing machine cycle. In the context of that, we're in election year, which is historically very bullish in those periods for the reasons I've mentioned. So you tell me where we are uh, from a weighing machine in terms of, of where things are likely to go uh, probabilistically. Now, picking the week, picking the month, picking the quarter, that's a different story. That comes to the flows. And now we can kind of dive into that piece. You want to unfuck your shit? <laughs> yeah, that's being recorded. <laughs> hey, listen, if you want to unfuck your future, then come and join us in the Real Vision community. Incredible platform, amazing content, some of the smartest people in the world, and amazing tools. And guess what? It'll cost you nothing. Come to realvision.com. I'll see you there. And let's help you unfuck your future. Yeah. yeah. And let's talk about it because obviously uh, there's a, first of all, huge amount of information, some really big ideas there. I want to unpack that. I want to explore it. Uh, talking about the the voting machine, uh, you know, if you're not following these numbers closely, S&P 500 year to date up uh, a little over 20% right now on my screen, uh, trailing 12 month up around uh, almost 28 and a half percent. You mentioned these big, long cycles. You mentioned uh, going back uh, to the New Deal. I suppose we could take it back further to another Roosevelt presidency, uh, about 25 years longer, if we want to talk about the beginning of the progressive era, uh, circa uh, around 1900. These are really, really big cycles that we're talking about here. But let's let's try and uh, dig in to the intersection of the voting machine versus the weighing machine and where we are. Uh, other themes that we talked about in detail the last time you were on this show, uh, this idea of, uh, you mentioned this idea that uh, that indexation has been around for a long time. Let's talk about the technology for getting exposure to that indexation uh, more cheaply, uh, the absolute mushrooming, uh, spiraling growth uh, of structured products uh, and other mechanisms. Let, let's talk a little bit about the framework of market mechanics right now and how it intersects with these broader cycles. I know these are big ideas, uh, but Jim, kick us off. Explain that as you see it from your perspective. So we just, uh, you know, important day to talk about this, not just because the Fed that you brought up, but from a flows perspective, uh, it's also OPEX, uh, quarterly September uh, options expiration uh, tomorrow, a, a quad witching day. Um, and, uh, you know, no better time to talk about market structure and flows than right here. Um, the I would argue a lot of the moves that we're seeing in the market and these really, you know, this big overnight 100 point move in the S&P, um, you know, obviously uh, bigger in the NASDAQ, 400 plus points, um, is a function of that structure more, in my opinion, than the 50 basis points, which was largely uh, priced in, right? Uh, I mean, people will talk about the central, you know, Japanese central bank, and yes, there are issues there. That's the narrative. And those things matter. Uh, but in the short term, these other structural effects matter more and have a bigger impact. Um, the OPEX effect uh, is, is such that, uh, you know, this is September. There's a, there's a reason we have seasonality around uh, uh, September. Uh, the big quarterly OPEX is the four that we have a year, March, June, September, December, all have the overwhelming majority of the um, uh, of the open interest in, in the market. Um, and the majority of structured products and other uh, options and con- convex positioning exist um, primarily in those in those expirations. Um, those expirations uh, and those those periods where all that positioning exists drive dramatic flows as time moves forward and as volatility, uh, uh, implied volatility 
changes, as well as the market moves. So you have the, the market movement are, are gamma effects. And the other ones are what we call Bama, Avana and Charm effects. I won't get too much in the second or, into the second order Greeks today, but the important part to understand is that um, at the end of the day, if an event passes, regardless of the outcome, and the world is hedged for it, right? Uh, that means dealers or the people who are warehousing that risk, that's banks, that's market makers, that's everybody else, is short those puts. They are short those hedges and they are they have to hedge this tail exposure, right? Um, that tail exposure is hedged with short market positioning, whether it be in futures or other, other structures around it, behind it. And at the end of the day, when that high positioning, which is because of all this buying, which has been priced ex more expensively, um, disappears because the event has passed, because the, the, the period of uh, the, these things have expired, those hedges need to be unwound and bought back. Um, and that's by the whole street, to be clear. That's by banks, that's by uh, market makers, that's by everybody. That's the risk of the marketplace being rehedged. That's a big, important concept that most people think are, you know, everybody thinks everything is a story, a narrative. Uh, and in the long term, the stories matter. In the short term, it's about supply and demand. And this is where real supply and demand, um, you know, is the, this is the rubber that meets the road, right? Um, so when you get into these periods, you have dramatic buyback of deltas uh, that are happening and massive ball compression as a result, not just because of the buyback, because everybody's decaying out of the short puts uh, that they are, that the, the short against other things that they are now getting cheaply. So all of those uh, those those ball effects, which are called VOMA and beta, uh, um, uh, come into play, and they they end up actually compressing volatility um, in the market in, in the short dated expirations. That's what Jim, we let see. Me just, let me just yeah. jump in here real quick because I, I, I we can get into the uh, the actual mechanics of volatility compression in just a second, but I want to frame this up uh, for folks uh, who may have. Um, who may have gotten in a little bit too deep in the last uh, statement that you made, because I want to explain to people why this matters, why it's so important. Uh, and I'd like to quote a wise man uh, named Jim Carson from the last time you were on, because this quote, uh, by the way, I watched our interview last night, uh, probably three times trying to get my head around some of these concepts, but I want to give people an understanding of, of, of the size of this and the scale of it. And this quote, I think really frames that up uh, so brilliantly. Uh, quote, this is from last time, July 9, 2024, quote, so the index nowadays has more volume and more trading than the actual constituents. I think it's important for people to know that. And when I say it's not just the futures, it's not just the index itself, it's not just the ETFs, it's all of the derivatives and structured products and everything else that's tied to those indexes as well. And when that's the case, it's not just the tail wagging the dog, it is the dog. The S&P 500 is the dog. That's what everybody's trading. That's what everybody's benchmarked against. That's what everybody's hedging against. That's where the majority of the trading and the positioning is. Jim, this is a big concept because, uh, you know, this is sort of uh, the opposite of what you learned in uh, in your uh, undergraduate finance class, that this notion uh, that what's happening is that individuals and institutions and firms are valuing uh, the future net present value of future cash flows of companies. It's not the way it's happening on an individual basis. It's the aggregate. Talk about this, and then we can talk about the second order Greeks and the volatility compression. But I want people to understand your thesis in terms of the significance and why, the why this drives the market in aggregate. Yeah, the, the investment game and process has become factorized to uh, such a point um, uh, that at this point, it's not about, uh, you know, there is idiosyncratic risk in the market. Uh, single stocks still matter. I'm not saying that they're irrelevant in any way, but the majority of capital uh, is tied to not just how the index performs, uh, but also to uh, how volatility and, and uh, factors tied to the index um, perform. That's where the supply and demand is. And in the short term, that is what's driving, um, again, 75 to 80% of what the uh, market is broadly doing. Um, not just uh, on a beta basis, but again, um, you know, there are now this massive dispersion trades that are uh, levered. I, I believe Millennium now has six pods, uh, you know, several uh, over a billion dollars. Um, we, are, we are looking... At a market that that essentially is controlling the constituents relative to an index, and uh, volatility itself is uh, notionally uh, significantly bigger exposure than the market 
itself, just the volatility markets. Um, and and uh, so I think that's that's important to understand. Uh, everything must be held together by arbitrage constraints, and there are all kinds of uh, pods and shops making sure everything gets held together versus one another and extracts an edge. But at the end of the day, the primary thrust of both direction and relative value is coming from um, indexes and derivatives and everything tied to those indexes. So understanding how those different uh, uh, things that are not linear, that are not two-dimensional, uh, by the way, um, uh, change uh, over time and ball and other change, factor changes is critical to understanding the flows that come uh, out of the underlying. I'm going to back up and actually make one another. I don't know how much I mentioned this last time. I don't believe I did, but I think this is one of the most important things I can get across. And this really blows people's minds who are from this fundamental world. Um, people call options derivatives. They call options derivatives because everybody came to, into investing and investing started by talking about an asset and having a value for an asset, a singular value. That price, or whether it's a stock or a bond or a commodity, that price for that asset is seen you know, from our, our, our historical reference point as the underlying. And so we call these other things that were created uh, options uh, as an example, as uh, derivatives. What people don't realize is that what an option is, uh, option and, and people talk about vol like an asset class, like it's a separate thing. Options and vol are not an asset class. They are the underlying distribution, the pricing of the underlying distribution of every asset. An option is not two-dimensional. We don't just buy or sell directly in the market. We, it is a node on a dis three-dimensional distribution. We're going from two dimensions to three. It is a node on a three-dimensional distribution that gives the whole personality. You are all of a sudden looking from a flat picture to a three-dimensional space at the character of an asset. I could give you two stocks. They are the same exact market cap. They are the same exact industry. I can take the labels off and say, look, they're the same. And then I would take the, the, the asset value away and look at the options chain. One could be incredibly right distributed with a left, fat left tail. The other one could be incredibly light left distributed with a right tail. They could have dramatically different long-term versus short-term expectations. The surfaces of those assets could look dramatically different. And you would look at them and be like, oh yeah, these are completely different stocks. But you would never know that from the expected value, which is the asset price. These asset price, whether it's a stock or a bond or a commodity, is simply the expected return of an incredibly rich distribution of options, prices, and the value. They must, by arbitrage constraint, equal one another. But from my perspective, that ex expected value is essentially just comes out of the much richer what the asset is, which is all of its nodes and its distribution. And in a sense, that asset value is the derivative. It is just coming out of, of, of that other pricing. Yeah, so when we talk about, like oh, this is the tail wagging the dog, it's not the tail wagging the dog. It is the dog in a very fundamental sense. It is the dog. And the reason it hasn't been traded more, and by, by the way, I've been in the business for 25 years. For 25 years, I have seen secular, dramatic, convex, Growth and options volumes all on the way. And every time everybody's like, oh, this is a, no, this is just a new trend. And we've gone, meanwhile, when I started to it, just quarterly options in the S&P 500 about every three to 4%. Now we have daily options. We have, uh, you know, ex, uh, uh, strikes every five points or, or you know, 0.05% in the market. We have, we have options for every single equity uh, that you can think of, right? Uh, not to mention every product. We've gone from 250 multipliers to 100 to 50 to 10 to 1. Now there's point 0.1. The point here is much like a new technology, this, these are network effects. You need to build up volume and, and, and interaction in order for market participants to take advantage of what is a superior technology, a superior way to bet on specific information that you have with more specific risk. And options are that. They are a superior way to position in the marketplace. And so their volume is not, a, is not just because people are, um, you know, uh, just, just want leverage, and are, are, you know, which is what the media will tell you. The, the dramatic growth 
uh, by the way, which I believe is just getting started. I think we're going to see 10 times this volume. And at some point, the equity volume will be, why would you ever play in equities? Um, when you, you can have a much more specific direct um, uh, way to position in the market. It's a matter of education. It's a matter of software that helps people do it. It's a matter of, of people like myself and others talking about it and educating on it. Um, and and they're just being more infrastructure for people to interact. So um, yeah, yes, it's a two-way street. At the end of the day, fundamentals uh, on, on a stock and the idios- idiosyncratic risk and, and positioning in two dimensions will change the value of that equity. And that perspective is not irrelevant, but it is it is not the optimal way to for the for the voting machine and positioning to play up. And uh, we believe that this is uh, just the beginning. Well, let's explain that. Let's do some of that education here because I know that this gets a little bit abstract. It's hard for people to get their heads around. Uh, first, I want to quote you from the last time you were on because you came at this, I thought, in a really interesting way. Quote, the constituents that have to fall in line with what's happening to the dog, uh, that's the parts of the dog and those parts must equal the dog. And at the end of the day, if the dog has to be put to sleep, if there is enough structure, product demand where the parts of the distribution are being sold and in such supply that the banks and the market makers Everybody else who is warehousing, that positioning has to cause the dog to continue to sleep. The dogs aren't going anywhere. You can have the parts that move one way or the other, but at the end of the day, the dog can't go. This is so critical to understanding this. Let's talk about this. Let's talk about the way that dealers work. Let's talk about the way that market makers work. Let's try and explain how gamma works uh, when those prices move. I know this is a lot, but folks, this is really so critical to understanding Jem's thesis for how markets work. Let's break this down. Let's do the options 101 and talk about that gamma hammer that swings and hits the dealers when prices move quickly. Yeah, and I want to be clear, it works in both directions. Uh, Everybody likes to focus on uh, the convexity of gamma, but if there's gamma supply, it can also, that convexity that's available will also pin volatility as well. It works two ways. Um, Let's start at the absolute 101 with how options work, because I think uh, for folks who are just looking at the cash markets, it can get a little bit confusing. Let's talk about the actual makeup, how this works. Yeah, volatility is a a V at its most basic level, a a straddle, buying a call and buying a put is zero delta. And and, and at that moment, uh, if it's at the money, uh, it has zero uh, delta or directional exposure. But what it does is it has exposure to the movement of and volatility of that asset. So, uh, you know, if you buy a put in a call for $20 uh, and, and the, the, the thing moves by that expiration by more than $20 for every dollar more, you make more money. You know, that's 101. Um, uh, so uh, it's not directional. And that, was that increase in the delta and exposure, right? If I, uh, if I go up by... Uh, if something is a 5% probability of being in the money and has a 5 delta or 5% exposure to the underlying, and then the market, it's a call, and the market goes up, that, that probability increases. It goes from 5 to 10 to 20 to 50, maybe to 100 at some point if it goes in the money, right? Um, at the end of the day, that is gamma. That's it. Gamma is the, uh, the increase in the probability of something being in the money. It is, uh, it is tied to the optionality um, of, of an option versus you know extrinsic uh, value, you can call it the optionality versus intrinsic when something is actually in the money um, um, and has a uh, real kind of one to one delta exposure eventually. Um, so, so those gamma effects are, are, are critical. There is an incent, in a sense, people call it leverage, embedded leverage in options in the sense that um, you're getting more notional exposure for a relatively small. Uh, amount uh, uh, of exposure. Think of it as insurance. I think that's an easy way for people uh, who are not familiar with these things to think. Uh, to think about uh, these things. Um, if I, you know, if you buy uh, ten thousand dollar insurance for your two and a half million dollar home, that ten thousand um, dollars, you know, most times, uh, you know, that's like a one delta option or or less. It has a very low probability of being in the money. But if something bad happens in the market, you know, your house burns down, uh, that ten thousand dollar year insurance can be worth two and a half million dollars. Right, well, that's that's gamma. That's gamma. That's 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 what that's what that looks like. Uh, and you can have it as insurance. The downside, you can have upside exp- uh, insurance as well for underlying assets. So at its core, uh, that gamma exposure now is, is what people are buying when they buy hedges uh, or insurance for the market. And those hedges, ultimately, if they're bought, need to be sold by someone. They think of it as an insurance company. The insurance company has to lay off its risk. It's not just going to keep selling insurance and not hedge themselves, right? They have to buy reinsurance or they have to go 
find a way to hedge that exposure. That's what these insurers, which are the dealers, do. That is a market maker, that is a bank, that is an entity who sees the value of selling this insurance at X price, uh, in not just to one person, but in a diversified way. And they, they look at hedging out that insurance and doing all kinds of things so they can lower their risk to quite low for a high return. So that's what a dealer is doing. That's what the market is doing at scale all the time. Um, and, and at the end of the day, those insurers, as that insurance, those insurance contracts come out, either need to sell more insurance uh, to continue doing that business, or they need to um, you know, get rid of their hedges that were protecting them on, on those contracts now that they've made their money. And those flows are critical to market structure, especially as these types of products become more actively traded and are in our superior way to position based on different outcomes along the distribution of the market. So hopefully that's a good 101. Uh, happy to kind of dive in more. But the important thing is those dealers who in that situation are short there now as they unwind it will reflexively have the opposite effect on the market. Um, so uh, in the gamma term, if there's short volatility of a, of a tail put and the whole market is shorted, they're trying to hedge it in different ways. If the market ha- all of a sudden goes to that point where these things uh, were and they go in the money down, now those uh, dealers have to manage that risk and the whole way down, they have to manage that risk. And that is a convex risk. As the delta goes from one to five to 20 to 50 to 100, that, you know, that has 100% leverage uh, in a sense to the market exposure. And they have to hedge out that as it goes. And those can... Uh, exacerbate and make that volatility worse. It can it can drive um, uh, cascades in the market that drive su- uh, you know supply and demand factors that can drive. The opposite can happen if there's selling of volatility. If if if, uh, if a massive amount of volatility has been sold to dealers and market makers, which we've seen in 2017 is the the best historic example. We had a 30 percent lower realized and implied volatility than any other time in 125 years. How do you get something that's 25 percent lower than 125 years of data? Options and volatility and the dominance of also during that period at the index level specifically drove historic um, uh, volatility compression. We didn't have a single pullback in 2017 of more than three percent. Um, yet the market was, you know, was up fifteen percent. So that and that was. And this this is such a critical point. What we're talking about 2017 and then the volatility unwind in 2018. Uh, this is the challenge is this reflexivity, this idea that there are feedback loops that occur uh, where you get amplifications of price moves. Uh, we talked about this a little bit last time, uh, but let's talk about the unwind because I think it's an interesting example of the XIV inverse VIX product in 2018. I think a product that everybody believed uh, who was who was really sophisticated, believed was poorly structured, uh, but nonetheless had a really spectacular unwind. And I think in many ways demonstrate some of the points that you're making. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so in a sense, the markets are a zero sum game, right? If you look at it, like there's always a buyer and a sell. You know, risk doesn't uh, disappear. It doesn't get pulled out of this universe. It just gets transferred from one hands to another. But what's important is when risk gets concentrated and leveraged into uh, certain types, uh, certain places that can no longer maintain that risk relative to other entities. And that's a really important kind of high level concept. Um, The majority of the significant supply and demand liquidations, I would argue 2020 was even part of this, despite most people saying that's all about COVID. There's a reason we had a V bottom there and it wasn't. you know, there, there was a massive amount of structured products and risk in, in uh, the, the, ex, the, the March expiration that we had there and, and all kinds of uh, knock-on effects that made that decline dramatically worse than it would have been under, under any other circumstance. I think 87 is a similar type of example. Those, those occurrences um, are, uh, are a function of, of that volatility uh, positioning. Um, at the end of the day, um, you cannot uh you cannot have uh you know concentrated positioning in a place and have a gamma effect happen and have s- enough losses by those entities without them having to liquidate essentially and that's what happened with XIV. it's just too concentrated too big in a like you said a, ultimately a flawed vehicle and ultimately when the flaw uh got you know started to seem like it was about to come then it was a self-fulfilling prophecy and, and uh, everybody um, kind of took it to where it eventually went. And that has big knock-on effects across the market. Um, uh, dealers act differently than your average kind of person who's speculating. 
a dealer needs to consistently, regularly rehedge their risk. They have more leverage on their books. Uh, and at the end of the day, though, they're, they're actively managing the position in real time. Um, so they are uh, continuously hedging and ch- continuing directly based on ball changes and market changes. And they're doing it all at the same time. And they all have the same position. So they're kind of chasing each other around on these things. So dealers have direct day-to-day, second-to-second, minute-to-minute trends that, that uh, based on if you understand what their positioning is, that, that, in, that dramatically change the distribution of outcomes and that voting machine over short periods of time, meaning daily, you know, hourly, daily, weekly, monthly, maybe even quarterly. Um, but over the long run, uh, these, these things rebalance between entities and unless there is a significantly growing and leveraged risk in the market. And generally that's uh, because uh, an entity is, uh, is not flexible, is unable to change their mandate. Think XIV, uh, think long-term capital management, think entities like that, that, that really um, have a big view that's too big relative to the market is imbalanced and um, are, um, are consistent in their approach. Um, uh, so um, I'll leave it there, but but that's the the real risk in markets, and and that happens over a period. When something ha- particularly goes on for a while, there's a, um, you know, people are backwards looking. They see the profitability of something. It's been a, you know, 2017 was an incredible time to sell a ball. If you kept selling it and selling it and selling it and selling, it, you went home every day and you made you took home another you know car um, every day, and it looked great. You went to the beach. You didn't have to work very hard. You just sold it and sold it and sold it and sold it. And so guess what? A lot of people sold it. And right. guess what? The position got too big. And guess what? That eventually it got so big that it was reflexive, 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 and re- reinvigorate, you know, kept on uh, happening until something happened and it broke. And when it broke, it broke spectacularly. That's not a surprise. Uh, you know, that, that's just how markets work at their core, whether it's options or any anything. Uh, people crowd and crowd and crowd and crowd until it gets too crowded. And then it, it creates a... a uh, it, it doesn't get rid of the risk. It just uh, changes into a fat left tail and, and makes the whole thing right distributed. It's kind of how life works, right? I mean, we're all implicitly Absolutely. short volatility. We expect that we're going to walk down the street, that tomorrow is going to look a lot like today. We're not going to get hit uh, by a fire engine. This is just the way that life works. I want to bring this back into today's price action because there's some interesting parallels here that I want to talk about. Uh, right now, NASDAQ 100 uh, looks like it's flirting uh, again uh, with that 20,000 level well, up about two and a half percent on the day. I want to read this quote from last time. Uh, quote, but if you're really betting for the long term, the next 10 years, 20 years, yes, getting the big picture right is critical. It's everything. You might go on a really wild journey on your way to that final outcome. And that's what the weighing machine is. This is what Graham calls the weight. At the end of the day, the weighing machine wins. Usually that rebalancing happens, the lack of liquidity. Everything comes back in line when there's no longer liquidity. And that's what I suspect will happen here. Into a decline, things will become more logical. Well, what we've got today is the opposite of that, right? We've got the liquidity flow coming from the Fed. You've got risk asset markets responding, repricing that liquidity coming into the system. This is more kicking the can down the road if we're following your thesis. Uh, The opposite of what you would expect when you would see the the uh, the weighing machine uh, and the voting machine to disagree. Let's talk a little bit about the short term directionality in your view of prices based on liquidity. Yeah, and I want to be incredibly clear. I have, despite this incredibly bearish view for equities and bonds for the last fifteen years, I have been incredibly bullish this year. Right. And the reason is because the the voting machine, uh, the, you know, not just the voting machine, like the, the because of the election, you know, the, the voting machine of markets, and and uh, you know you. Just because you are uh, worried about a long-term outcome or, or proper, appropriately concerned about it, doesn't mean that uh, that you need to bet uh, short on the market and be uh, in a, in some short period uh, starting to position. To tie it back to the options positioning, there's ways to bet on this to benefit from a blow-off top uh, and and a and a potential eventual weighing machine decline. You don't have to bet on short or long. And uh, that is the beauty of options broadly, and, the, and it gives you all kinds of flexibility. The likelihood of fast, big upside moves in the next three to, 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 to four months is uh, much higher than any other probability, yet it's priced at the lowest probability of any other outcome. Um, and, and increased volatility, which most people associate with downside, is highly probable to the upside in the next three to four months. Uh, again, That's the V something- you were just talking about. Correct. So you can bet on long volatility and win on the upside. And if and when the decline happens, benefit from that. 
as well. So, um, and that's exactly what we've expected. So, uh, you know, this 100 point move today at this point in the cycle, given where we stand in the, the broader cycle, is completely in line with that thesis and makes complete sense. Um, it's it's when you start thinking about things in two dimensions and and uh, in terms of 10, 15 year fundamentals that you get in trouble. Um, and and I think that's uh, that that's that's the problem with ninety percent of of how most people kind of uh, invest uh, or or I guess even trade these markets. Um, to exactly that point, S and P five hundred up about ninety five points today, fifty seven twelve right now on my screen. Uh, let's talk about how much room this may have to run in your view when you talk about the short term liquidity driven upside of these markets. How do you think about that? How do you frame that? Where are the boundaries? Where are the parameters? Yeah, let's talk more specifics to this last three months uh, of the year. And, and, and I think, uh, you know, three and a half months, I think there's an incredibly important, actually, let's say four months till mid January, and uh, important seasonal effects. And when I say seasonal, I'm not talking about Santa Claus and and uh, some magical construct. I'm talking about actual brass tax supply and demand realities to what happens in this market at the end from September uh, expiration till January expiration. Um, if you look normally during the year, you have the last uh, two months of the year, uh, starting really in middle of November till middle of January. That's the last month and a half of the year into the first two weeks of January, are the most bullish period of, um, uh, of markets. And that's true for a reason. And, and it's most concentrated in that last month, mid-December to mid-January. People call it Santa Claus and the January effect. Let's kind of start there. Why, why, you know, why do they call it magical things? Because they don't understand why it happens. They just see that it happens. But it's the statistical anomaly is dramatic, right? And not over 10 years, 20 years, it's over 100 years. Um, why is it? Because most years, the market's up. And when the market's up, there is a reinvestment leveraging effect that happens on the beginning of the year. That is the first of reason. There's other reasons, which I will uh, kind of begin, uh, we'll talk about. But let's talk about that one first. Most people think, well, if I was long a million dollars, they, they assume that people, ever, the whole market works like they do. If I long a million dollars and the market goes up 20%, they're long at $1.2 million. And why would they invest more at the high? If anything, they would want to take some off, right? Or take down some risk. But that's not how the world works. Finance doesn't work that way. Finance has leverage in it. The whole system, most money is leverage. The whole banking system is 10 to 1 leverage. Every hedge fund, every, every relative value, the whole market making structure, everything has not small, like 50% leverage, has, has 5, 10x leverage on it. The whole system is leverage. And so if the market goes up by 20% in a year, which is where we are now, and the whole market, by the way, the whole equity market in the U.S. is about 60, uh, 60 trillion. I think we talked about these numbers last time, but I'll just reiterate because it's a very important point. The whole world is about 120 trillion. And assets tied to the equity indexes here in the U.S. Um, constitute about another 130 trillion. So you've got to have about $250 trillion of assets that are tied to this index. Quick math, 20% increase in those assets means you got $50 trillion more of collateral. People call it the wealth effect. I don't like that term because, again, it makes it into like we're all individuals trading this thing. You got $50 trillion more money in the system. That's collateral. That's hard dollars that you can pit against risk. And managers don't manage things in notional dollars. They manage it based on risk, on exposure. So if I was 10 to, 10 to X levered on $1 trillion, that was $10 trillion, right? And now I just made uh, you know, 20% on, on that. Now I need to leverage that money because I have new money in, in, in the account. So there is a leveraging reinvestment effect that is dramatic. Again, I think $50 trillion happens throughout the year. Now, it doesn't all happen in first of the year. That would be crazy, right? It happens continuously, uh, but it's concentrated at the end of month, it's concentrated at the end of quarter, and it's concentrated at the beginning of the year. If 10% of that $50 trillion gets reinvested in slower moving reinvestment vehicles, new products, new money on the first of the year. That's $5 trillion. Let me put that in context, $5 trillion. The average volume, the net volume that moves markets on a given day, like today, is 75 to 100 billion. We're up today two and a half percent in the NASDAQ uh, on 
hundred billion dollars or so of money. Maybe it's more today. But the point here is this is like a, uh, a low float venture. The whole thing is like a low float venture capital investment. There is so little trading day to day relative to the size of the market that it doesn't take much to move the market on the voting machine on a supply and demand basis. There's a JP Morgan trade that people talk about all the time that happens is about to happen here at the end of the quarter. It's a $50 billion fund, uh, maybe up to $75 billion. I got to look. Um, but this one, I think, is about $50 billion that happens at the end of the quarter. They have other expirations of it. The one that happens at the end of the quarter has a dramatic effect on volatility and market outcomes. Everybody knows this. People talk about it at, at nauseum. But very few people talk about the fact that $50 billion is moving a $250 trillion market. That's the reality. This is a leverage machine. And the momentum in it is dramatic. And it doesn't act continuously. That momentum effect happens at certain intervals. And January 1st is the biggest interval. And so when the market is up, in particular, that, uh, that Santa Claus part is a front running of it. And the January effect is the net result of all that buying that comes in the beginning. I mean, so if you know about- that's sitting out there, right? What do people start doing in November? They start preparing for it. People that know, right? People that get it start preparing for it. And on top of that, you have, this is most years without the election. We're going to get to the election. And in most years, you also have only 60% of the volume weighted time. What is volume weighted time? We have more holidays in that period, Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, uh, MLK, right? You have more of the holidays during that period, not to mention dramatically reduced volume around those holidays because they're not like every holiday. Memorial Day is not the same as Christmas. Memorial Day is not the same as Thanksgiving. People take the week off. You have all kinds of volume decreases. And it's not just here, but it's globally. And that dramatic reduction of time, which is what it is, accelerates all of these structured buyback flows in the, in the, in the skew in the markets that we've been talking about all this time, right? All those Vana charm effects, those get double speed as we go through this period. Not just that, the December expiration, we talked about quarterly expirations and their importance, is by far the biggest expiration all year. Why? Because it's on there as leaps years out in advance. People are trading it and trading and trading. It's the end of the year. And so the amount of buyback is also higher during those periods for that exact same reason. So now you have these flows uh, piling on in the period leading up to that. And then guess what? Everybody's tied to the same performance. And if they don't, if they underperform in this period, there's a problem. So this creates a reflexive, oh my God, I got to get in there effect, which just then reiterates and reflexively forces these things out. So there's a reason the season out exists. People don't like understand the actual realities. They talk about Santa Claus and all kinds of magical things, but these are real. This is the voting machine at play. And this, by the way, doesn't have to do like with uh, was our, did the Fed say something? Did uh, did did, did uh, were their earnings good? Um, you know uh, what's happening in geopolitics? No, they're just the way the machine works, and it's structural, and that's why it happens again and again. Now. To be clear, this is a little different because we have an election this year and election years have different effects. The election has a massive event ball. Rightfully so. There's all kinds of different policy changes and things that can come out of it. People are worried about the outcome. They want to hedge for that outcome. But guess what? That also creates more hedging. This is, uh, people will call it the wall of worry. It's not a wall of worry. It's actually supply and demand. You have a bunch of people buying puts, right? uh, In the market and hedge. And if those puts blow off, then that pushes the market higher. And so that effect, again, and that is massive now in, in the election, uh, which is part of what's driven and why we were able to uh, predict this kind of wobble in the fall and all the volatility that increases we've seen coming out of the fall, is out there driving dramatic risk in the short term. Um, uh, but you know, if a tail doesn't happen, this thing has to continue higher. It has to, it's just fuel to that fire. So that's sitting there right behind uh, the next you know, six weeks. So basically we have a six week window, right? Uh, where this thing would have to drop 15% from here for these flows to, to kind of uh, uh, you know, interact. And the, the more time passes and the vo- more volatility comes out, the more things push higher. And they do not, markets do not wait for these. So I'm not saying it's a free lunch. There's no free lunch. There is a tail out there. If this thing drops 15 to 20%, it could be way worse. And that's how uh, you know, something like COVID and, you know, get a 30% decline, right? Because once it starts, those gamma effects of all that out of the money, which is massive and, and huge for the market leverage, um, can be dramatic. But 
the momentum effects and they're coming day by day that sit back in the last quarter of this year are dramatic and meaningful. And the Wang machine machine doesn't really care about anything but those supply and demand factors. Now, come January 15th, that voting machine dramatically changes in terms of supply. And, demand. and if we do push higher from here, given the factors we started this whole conversation with in the weighing machine, time for dramatic concern. Time to be ready to hedge. So base case, based on that, if you don't see this snapback of 10 to 15% where you'd see the reflexivity begin to kick in, those difference in magnitudes of cash flows. I mean, these are huge numbers we're talking about. I, my back of the envelope was 10 to the 10 versus uh, 10 to the 14. Uh, these are huge numbers, hard for people to get their heads around. But if you don't get that snapback of 10 to 15% by the end of the year, the expectation in your view is this continued drift upward higher just based on the mechanics of the flow. I don't, I don't like the word drift because uh, it's going to be pretty, pretty volatile. Uh, this is not like a May, June, July, uh, where we didn't have a 3% pullback and market just kind of drifted. This is a significantly increased squeezing of shorts, uh, a, a dramatic buying uh, wave in markets that likely will end in a blow off top. Um, I would expect 6,000 to 6,100 at a minimum in the S&P. Um, and, uh, and, and in that type of environment, volatility will likely be increasing into the upside. Uh, again, rightfully so, especially given how low that volatility is to the upside right now, and especially given the amount of risks that sit uh, to the downside into next year. All right, Jim, I've got but to ask you, how are you- Directly, getting, I agree with you. How are you getting exposure to that position of that target to 6,000 on the S&P? How are you playing it? What's the positioning? Long dated calls. Um, so when I say long dated, I'm talking uh, March, uh, June of next year calls uh, in the S&P, which are very cheap. Um, uh, you know, you're talking about a 10, 11 vol in a market that historically has had an average vol of 17. I believe the vol next year, given market dynamics and the risks uh, geopolitically and other things that are also holding at bay till the election and, and the realizations on that end um, is honestly mispriced. And it's a mispriced as a function of structural flows, not because somebody has a, a, a bet on that they want to be short that. Uh, that's just the realities of how positioning works in the S&P 500. And that's an opportunity. Jen Carson, these conversations, they're always some of my favorite here on Real Vision. I know these are some very big picture ideas, uh, but certainly admire your ability to come out and take a stand and actually talk about the way you're positioned on your views uh, and the mechanism of how you express them as we have a few more minutes left, I know we're running long, but I just don't want to cut this one short because there's just so much to say here. Uh, let's start uh, by giving some of your final thoughts and some of your key takeaways here from this conversation. We've obviously covered a tremendous amount of ground uh, about the underpinnings of this from a philosophical, uh, mathematical perspective, right into the expression of the trade. Uh, give us some final thoughts, key takeaways, and we'll just talk a little bit about them from there because I know I'm going to have more questions. Yeah, I think uh, if there's one last thing to say, right, this is, uh, you know, you have to think about uh, bets in duration and three dimensions, really thinking about uh, uh, much like options do, right? You need to be thinking about uh, why something is likely to happen over a week, over a month, over a quarter, over a year, over a decade. And many times what's likely ha to happen over a decade uh, has nothing to do with what's likely to happen over a week. And what's likely to happen in a week may have nothing to do with what's likely to happen uh, over a decade. Um, and often that's the case. The two things are not particularly correlated. Um, again, if you look at, there's a ton of academic research on this. Fundamentals have zero correlation to market outcomes over any period less than 10 years. Yet everybody is told that you buy stocks and you trade stocks based on fundamentals. That's not how markets work. I'm here to tell you, as somebody who was absorbing all that liquidity, you know, 13% of the flow of, of the S&P 500 options, that is not how markets work. Market, markets worst about, work based on who's buying and who's selling. And the majority of those play, flows on a day-to-day -day basis have nothing to do with fundamentals. They have to do with supply and demand. So I would keep your eyes on, on, on where the rubber meets the road in the short term. Uh, invest uh, with bigger picture over the long run, but be thinking and managing day-to-day -day and month-to-month -month exposure. Uh, based on factors that have nothing to do with that long-term uh, realities. Jim, I can't improve on that. I want to just leave it there. Uh, 
fantastic conversation always when you come and join us on Real Vision. Uh, this is one I always have to do my homework for. Jem Carson, fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Ash. Always a pleasure. Thanks for watching. And don't be afraid to watch this one two or three times. I know I'm going to have to. Have a great afternoon, everybody. What if you could invest in a hard asset like silver and then earn a return in that same asset by passing the fiat dollar system entirely? Now you can. Monetary Metals has made a name for itself by generating a yield on gold and silver for their clients over the past eight years and counting. Now they're offering the first silver bond in almost 200 years with a 12% annual interest rate paid in physical ounces of silver. Available to accredited investors only, investors in the bond receive a fixed 12% coupon on silver paid in physical ounces of silver, plus any silver price appreciation. Over half the bond has already been sold and the remaining allocations are going fast. Do not miss being a part of this historic offering. Protect and grow your wealth in an asset that has stood the test of time. Secure your spot at realvision.com slash metals. We hope you enjoyed the video. At Real Vision, we help you understand the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy with in-depth analysis from real experts. Join the revolution at realvision.com.